Facebook, I'm in various discussion groups concerning Christianity. Some of these groups are focused to particular subjects. Others are very general where anyone can start a conversation or ask a question. And in one particular group uh, I am in, I noticed that many people have been asking questions about the sinner's prayer. One person in particular asked very generally to the group if anyone prayed the prayer. And I just politely commented, well, it's not in the Bible, so I've never prayed this prayer. But I noticed a lot of people were arguing that it actually is in the Bible. And I figure since so many people believe it to be in the Bible and so many people use it to come to Christ, it would be helpful to explore this subject. And what we're going to do is we're going to begin by briefly exploring the history of the sinner's prayer. And then we're going to talk about the rationale people use from various passages to prove that it is so. So let's begin by asking, what is the sinner's prayer? This is normally a particular prayer uh, that is suggested by certain Protestant preachers that after they preach the gospel, they will say, if anyone wants to become a Christian, repeat this prayer after me. And it is argued that as you're saying this prayer, or after you say this prayer, you receive Christ into your life and are saved. Uh, there are variations of this prayer, but this is the one used by Billy Graham. And it goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In your name, amen. Now, I think it'd be helpful just to briefly look at the history of this prayer. Now, I think we can figure out everything we need to from the Bible. But sometimes it's helpful to look at history to consider how new and how recent certain doctrines and practices are. Many people integrate certain ideas or concepts or practices into their Christianity, and they don't even realize how old or how recent they are. And I want to read just a few quotes from a dissertation uh, created by Dr. Paul Harrison Chitwood, who to uh, get his doctorate degree, he wrote on the history of this subject. And I do think it's helpful to point out that uh, Mr. Chitwood is a Baptist, um, and so this is not any kind of brotherhood material or anything like this. And I think this is important to note because a lot of Baptists do use this prayer. And so, uh, and that's not to say he agrees with us on the subject of salvation, but I, I do think it is important to look at an unbiased source concerning the history of this subject. And in his dissertation, he writes this, What many people fail to realize is that although the sinner's prayer is widely and enormously popular today, no variation of it is found in the Bible. Even he admits this in, in his historical research. Now, he also goes on to say that research indicates that the sinner's prayer cannot be found in regular use before the 1940s. This evidence points strongly to Billy Graham as the possible originator of the prayer, but it's not conclusive. When asked whether he was responsible for creating the prayer, Graham responded that he had been using it a long time, as, he, as long as he can remember, even back in Bible school days, but that he could not recall if the prayer came from someone else or not. What is certain is, however, that, that Graham has played a major role in popularizing the sinner's prayer. Now, his dissertation is, is more than 100 pages long. You can easily find it on the internet. And he does explain how certain ideas in the 17 and 1800s helped create an atmosphere for such a prayer to be utilized. But even he admits in his research that we really don't find a frequent use of it until the 1940s, which begs the question, what did everyone do before that to become a Christian? So even though there's not a large historical precedent before this, with, uh, before, you know, a hundred years ago, let's now consider the main passages that people go to in the Bible to support the idea of a sinner's prayer. If you will turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 verses 10 through 14. This is a very popular one that is cited in favor of the sinner's prayer. And we'll go ahead and read, read this briefly and then 
explore the rationale that is given. Luke chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. <clears throat> Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give all tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went, 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 this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So two, the, the two verses in particular that are normally emphasized are verse 13 and 14, where this man says, God be merciful to me, a sinner, and then Jesus says he went to his house justified. So we should ask, can we use this pattern in this parable for becoming a Christian today? Well, there are a few problems. One... These men are already in a covenantal relationship with God. As we see from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, every uh, son of Abraham, let me rephrase that, everyone who entered into a covenant with Moses at Sinai, they and their children were always a part of it. They were born into this relationship. And if one was seeking to enter into a relationship with God, while the covenant of Moses was still in effect, they would have had to go it through a, different, very, a very different process. As we see in Exodus chapter 12, verses 43 through 51, they would have to undergo circumcision. Nothing of any kind of prayer. The second problem with using this passage as a template for becoming a Christian is that at this point in the biblical narrative, Christianity does not exist. As we see in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28, Christianity could only exist with the shedding of Christ's blood, and as we see in Acts 2, the coming of the Spirit. These two things had not happened yet. Another problem is that these men would not be qualified to become Christians, because even those who, uh, who preach the sinner's prayer will acknowledge, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that a person must believe Jesus rose from the dead. At this point in the biblical narrative, Jesus is still alive and he had not yet died, nor had he rose from the dead. And the fourth problem is when we consider the context, we see that Jesus is not teaching on how one becomes a Christian, but on the kind of humility we should have toward God. Notice how it begins in verse 9. We didn't actually read this verse. Notice what Luke comments before Jesus gives this parable says that he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. As we see, the point of this parable is to demonstrate the kind of attitude we as, as, as followers of God should have in reference to humility and respect for others. So we see this passage has no reference to any kind of a sinner's prayer. But let's look at another verse that's normally demonstrated, or I should say uh, cited, to prove the sinner's prayer. Let's look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. And if you'll turn with me there, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, we'll, we'll consider the verse, then we'll consider the context. In this particular passage, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, the rationale given from this verse is if you want Jesus to come into your life, you have to invite him in. And one of the ways in which you can do that is by saying the sinner's prayer. But let's explore the context and see if there's a little bit more to the story. Let's begin in verse 14. Revelation chapter 3. Let's begin in verse 14. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, and the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot, so, so because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. 
For you say, I am rich, and I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by silver, so that you may be rich, and white garments, so that you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent." Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant with him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his, on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we should ask, is Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, an example of the sinner's prayer? Well, part of the problem is, is we see that this letter is not written to alien sinners, but it's actually written to people who are already Christians. It's written to the church at Laodicea. And as we see in Revelation chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, we see that Every letter in chapters 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation is written to churches, people who are already Christians. And if you want to take time to read this small section of Scripture, you know that every message Jesus sends to these churches is either of encouragement or a call to repentance or sometimes a little bit of both. So why does Jesus say in verse 20 that they need to open the door? to invite him in. Well, because the way the Laodiceans are living their lives, it is as though they have kicked Jesus out. Notice what we see in verse 17. He says, For you say, I am rich, and I have prospered, and I need nothing. The Christians at Laodicea had become so dependent on their wealth and their prosperity, they did not think of Jesus or think that they needed him. And so, in a, in a very figurative way, he is saying that they need to change their attitude and reintegrate him back into their life. And of course, he uses this idea of table fellowship to emphasize the need for them to restore their relationship. So we see this verse is not concerning how one becomes a Christian, but how a sinful Christian must repent. Now let's go ahead and look at another passage that is often used to uh, provide evidence for the sinner's prayer. Let's go to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, we'll begin in verse 9. 1 John chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 9 and look at verse 10 as well. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And so the idea from this verse, what, what many will say, is if you are a sinner, you need to confess your sin to God. One of the ways in which you can do that is through the sinner's prayer, and then God will forgive you. But let's ask ourselves, is this an example of the sinner's prayer, or does John have something else in mind? Well, let's begin at the beginning of the context. Let's look at verse 6. Notice what John says. He says, If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Notice what he says in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, do sinners have fellowship with Christ? No. Only Christians do. Uh, move to verse 7. Notice what he says. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Notice what he says, if we walk in the light. Do sinners walk in the light? No, only Christians do. Jump down to chapter 2, verse 1. It's a different chapter, but it's the same context. Notice what he says. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Notice what he says. He says, we have an advocate with the Father. Do sinners have an advocate with the Father? 
No, only Christians do. When we look at the surrounding context, we see that he is writing to people who are already Christians. And when you, if you actually want to explore the book in your own time, it would take you maybe about seven or ten minutes to, to read the whole thing. We see that one of the main emphasis is characterizing what a real Christian lifestyle looks like. And that's what he's addressing here on what we as Christians do when we do sin, when we do fall short. And that is we go to God, we confess our sin, and we have confidence that he will forgive us. But there is no example of what a person needs to do to become a Christian in this chapter because it's not addressed to sinners, it's addressed to people who are already Christians. Let's go ahead and look at one more passage. And this is one of the more popular ones that are used to support this idea of the sinner's prayer. Let's look at Romans chapter 10, and we're going to read verses 9 through 10 and verse 13. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now jump down to verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now we're going to explore this passage, and it may seem like I'm going to ignore verse 13. I'm not. I'm just going to bring it up later, just so you know. So those who promote the sinner's prayer will go to this passage and say, look, if you want to be saved, you need to confess the lordship of Jesus. And one of the ways you confess the lordship of Jesus is you go to him in prayer and you acknowledge his lordship. But let's unpack that for a moment. Now we do see you do have to confess the lordship of Jesus, but there is an assumption made here. The assumption is that when confession is made, it is made to Jesus directly. Now, I looked at every reference to confession in the New Testament uh, with some biblical software. I didn't read the whole New Testament for, for this sermon. I just Google. I didn't Google. I, I searched the word confession in one of my biblical software, and it brought up every single example. And when we find confession in reference to God, we do find the idea that we need to confess our sin to him, but the only reference to confessing the lordship of Jesus in his presence is found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 11. And if you look at that passage, you'll see that in the context, it's talking about the final day when everyone sees Jesus with their own eyes and they acknowledge his lordship. But as we know, by that time, it will be too late. Every other reference to confession and reference to salvation involves confessing Jesus' lordship to other people. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 through 33, and then we'll look at 1 Timothy 6. In Matthew chapter 10, 32 through 33, he says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So we see what Jesus emphasizes is the idea of confessing his lordship to other people. That is what is emphasized. And in reference to Timothy's conversion, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, Paul writes to him, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Whenever we see any kind of confession of Jesus' Lordship before the final day, it is in reference to the kind of confession we make in the presence of others, not in a prayer we make to Jesus himself. Now, another thing that should be considered about this passage is, is Paul even giving a formula for how one need, what one needs to do to be saved, or is he addressing the attitude of those who have accepted Jesus versus those who have rejected him? Uh, and if you wanted to explore the context of this passage, I would recommend reading Romans chapter 9 all the way through Romans chapter 11. And there he characterizes the difference between those who have accepted Jesus versus those who have rejected him. But for the sake of argument, let's just say Paul is 
giving a formula for what one has to do to be saved. That's how it's normally used and interpreted. So let's just say that is the case. Now notice what we find in Romans chapter 10, verse 10. And uh, uh, read closely in your Bibles because your translation might say something a little bit different. And uh, keep in mind, this, this particular translation is from the ESV. And notice what it says. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, I, I love the ESV. You guys know I like the ESV. They may drop the ball a little bit here. Notice how it, how it is worded. One believes and is justified. It almost gives the impression that as soon as you believe, justification happens automatically. Or as soon as you confess, it happens automatically. I think the New American Standard Bible might handle this passage better than any other. Notice how it phrases verse 10. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Now you may say, well, what is the difference? And what the New American Standard Bible emphasizes in reference to the Greek is that this is a process. If you want to be saved, if you want to enjoy the result of righteousness and salvation, you have to believe. And if you continue down that process, it will result in those things. If you want to uh, be saved, you have to confess. And it will result in justification and, sal and salvation. But it is a part of a process. Um, and uh, even proponents of the sinner's prayer will acknowledge that there's a little bit more to it than just these two things. Uh, I have yet to found someone who teaches the sinner prayer deny the importance of repentance that we find in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. That it's not just about belief and confession, but there's repentance as well. And one of the things I want us to emphasize about what we find in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, is the word for. Or I should say, uh, at least in the New American Standard Bible, is translated as resulting. And I want us to look at another example of this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. This will become important in a moment. The word here that is translated resulting is the Greek word ice. And it's often translated for, but it expresses this idea of achieving a particular result. For example, in Matthew 26, 28, Jesus is talking about the effect of his sacrifice. And notice what he says. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What he is, he, what he is emphasizing in that verse is that if he sheds his blood, he will... Uh, create the result of providing the forgiveness of sins. It's the same word used there. And just make a mental note of that. And I want you now to turn to Acts chapter 2. And as you're there, let's consider what we have in Romans chapter 10. What we do see very clearly is that if we do want to be saved, we do have to believe and we do have to confess. And let's consider how they all come together in an actual example of conversion. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 37. But before we do, allow me just to briefly summarize the context. What we find in Acts chapter 2 is that about 50 days earlier, Jesus had been crucified. And then, three days after that, he had been raised from the dead. And now the Spirit has come, giving the, uh, the apostles miraculous powers, indicating that the last days have finally come. And as this is all happening... Peter is preaching, and he uses the scriptures, the empty tune, and the, and the signs that are being performed in their presence to indicate that Jesus is Lord, and not only that, they are guilty of his crucifixion. Let's consider how they respond. Acts chapter 2, let's look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Now, what can we observe from verse 37? Well, notice it says that they were pierced to the heart. And what is the implication of that? They believed. They believed that Jesus was Lord and that they were guilty of sin. What's the next thing that happens? They ask, what shall we do? 
they want to respond to Peter's message. And by implication, they are acknowledging the lordship of Jesus. If they didn't want to do that, they wouldn't have said anything. And maybe it's not a formal declaration where they say Jesus is Lord, but they've heard Peter's message, and now they want to respond. So they're asking, what shall we do? Notice what Peter tells them to do in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when they ask, What shall we do? Does we, why doesn't Peter give them a prayer to pray? Why doesn't he say, repeat this prayer after me and you will be saved? After all, if that is what Christ and the apostles intended all along, wouldn't this be the perfect place to introduce such a practice or a doctrine? But as we noted earlier, such an idea or practice did not exist till less than a hundred years ago. Notice what he says instead, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the word there for for is the same word we find in Romans chapter 10 verse 10 where Paul says that belief and confession result in salvation. We see they started the process with belief. And then they acknowledge the Lordship of Christ. And Peter says, you have to do two more things. You have to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Now, remember what we also read in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Someone might naturally ask, well, Peter says to be baptized. However, Paul says that we have to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. And wouldn't that make more sense to understand that in reference to our prayer versus baptism? Let's see how the early Christians understood what it means to call on the name of the Lord. Let's look at Acts chapter 22. And if you'll turn with me there, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And keep in mind the context. Paul is reaccounting his conversion. We know that he saw the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. He spent three days fasting and praying because of his contrition. Finally, Ananias shows up and tells him what he needs to do because he clearly already believes he's clearly already repented but he has to do one more thing notice what he what ananias tells him now why do you delay get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name now notice ananias doesn't give him a brief prayer to pray he doesn't say repeat after me he doesn't say, call on his name and then be baptized. He doesn't say, be baptized and then call on his name. Notice, he associates all three of these things as, as, they are, as though they are done together. That he needs to be baptized to wash away his sins, calling on his name. The first century Christians understood that if you wanted to call on the name of the Lord to be saved, you needed to be baptized. This is why Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, associates water baptism with making an appeal to God to receive a good conscience. And this is what is emphasized here. Now, why do the scriptures place so much emphasis on baptism? Well, we don't have time to explore all the nuances, but just allow me to summarize a few passages for you to consider on your own time. What we find in Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, we find that when one is baptized into Christ, that is when God works his salvation. We also find in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, that when we are baptized, we are buried into Christ. We die to our old self and are given a new life. This is why Jesus in John chapter 3, verse 15 describes baptism as a new birth. And as this process happens, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, that through the Spirit we are added to the body of Christ. And again in Acts 2.38, we enjoy the forgiveness of sins. And so if one wants to come to Christ, we find a very simple pattern. One hears and understands the gospel. They believe it. They repent. They repent. 
they confess the lordship of Jesus, and then they are baptized into Christ. And if a person has come to Christ a different way, maybe through the sinner's prayer, maybe they should ask themselves this question. Maybe they should ask, will God accept this? And by the way, I hope he does. I hope in the final age when I wake up in my celestial penthouse in the New Jerusalem, I go out and I find all my friends who prayed the sinner's prayer. That is the reality that I want to exist. But of course, one has to ask the question, where is the evidence for that kind of confidence? After all, we find no example of such a path or pattern in Scripture. And we have to ask ourselves, will God accept a man-made path over the one he has clearly laid out? And another thing that we should ask ourselves is, what kind of attitude does it reflect to God if God has clearly given us instructions to follow in order to be saved and we choose something else? What does it say to him if we say, yeah, but your path makes us uncomfortable. It feels too much like a work. So instead, I'm going to say this prayer because I'm more comfortable with what my preacher or what my pastor told me to do. And another thing someone should ask themselves, if, if they have ever prayed this kind of prayer, is if you really take pride in your Protestantism. Do you really take pride in the slogan, sola scriptura, that scripture alone is sufficient. Because if you do, if you truly believe the scriptures alone are sufficient, why would we seek to be saved by a man-made path? A man-made path that is not very old. Now, of course, one might still ask this question, well, I did say the sinner's prayer, but then later I was baptized, so am I okay? And by the way, I hope you are. But there's one startling passage that we have to consider in Acts chapter 19. And if you will turn with me there. Acts chapter 19. Let's just briefly consider this passage beginning in verses uh, 1 through 6. And it happened while Paulus was at Corinth. Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And, when they, and, and they said, No, we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now notice how Paul asked that question. He initially begins by asking, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And he uses the term believe to generally refer to the process of salvation. As we noted before, it's a very important process. But it turned out that they had not received the Holy Spirit because they were baptized with the wrong baptism. And unfortunately, many of the baptisms that we find today are for man-made reasons. So the question is, if God did not accept their baptism, will he accept the baptism that you experience? And that's a question that you have to ask yourself. And if, if that's the case, if you have any concerns about that, you don't have to have any concerns any longer. We'd be glad to assist you. If anyone is here today and they have heard the gospel and understand it, they believe it to be true, they are willing to repent of their sins, verbally confess the lordship of Christ before these witnesses, and be baptized into Christ. We can all help you with that right now. Or if you're here today, and maybe you already are a Christian, but like the Laodiceans, you've allowed something else in your life to take priority, and you realize you need to invite Christ back into your life. If that is the case, we'd love to pray for you. We know God will forgive you, and he will give you the strength and the wisdom to do better. If there's anything we can do for you now spiritually, please come forward as we stand and sing.